Okay, now let's start on uh, what are called ray optics. So we're not going to deal with the wave nature of light in this chapter. And we're going to deal with, rather than the wave fronts, we're going to deal with the light rays that are perpendicular to the wave fronts. A light ray is what we'll consider to be a beam of light. The ray points in the direction the wave front is moving. Alright, so if we have here um, light from a point source, an infinitely small point of light, I'll draw it like a star there. If it goes through an aperture, again, we'll ignore the diffraction interference effects. So let's say I've got an aperture with an L cut out in it, like this. And then I've got a screen over here. All you need to do to find out the shape of the uh, image on the screen is to draw a straight line from the source to each point in the aperture. Looks like my screen needs to be bigger. So you just connect straight lines from the aperture to the corresponding point on the image. Like that. Now, that's for a point-like source of light. What if we have an extended source, something that has a, an actual measurable width or size? So let's say that I've got a person here. <clears throat> We'll call the source our object, and so I'm going to use a subscript O for object. So for uh, the height of the object, H0, uh, HO, I mean, that's the height of the object. And let's say that I've got a small aperture, not, nothing with a complicated shape like this, but simply a tiny hole, a pinhole. Now, I need to have a dark room so that I've got, I don't have any other sources of light. Obviously, this one's going to do it. The dark room in Latin is called camera, which means room, obscura, which means dark. So you've got a small hole over here, the aperture, and then you've got a wall that's your screen there. Now, if you connect up points on this, draw them through the tiny aperture there, Let's see. Really, you know what? I want to have this thing data farther away. Where's my place? I want to have it be smaller. There. I've got a small camera of sphere where the screen is close to the aperture. So let's go with this foot. There. And any point in between comes to a point in between. So you wind up with an inverted, upside down image of what you have for your object outside. So the image height is H sub I, I for image. Now, let's take a look. The distance from the object to the aperture is called the object distance, D O. And the image distance is going to be di from the aperture to the image. And it turns out that geometry is pretty simple. And you find out that the ratio of the image height to the object height is the same as the ratio of the image distance to the object distance. Nice little bit of plain geometry there. <coughs> now, by the way, there's a whole community of artists who work with uh, camera obscura. And you can do nothing more than, uh, you can do something as little as taking a, uh, an apartment, a bedroom in an apartment, covering over the window with a, a sheet with a hole cut through it, and if you've got bright sunlight outside, the, the, the light reflected off of all of those objects will be projected onto the uh, wall opposite your, um, 
your editor. In doing so, then you just take a picture of what that is. And that, that was the beginnings of a modern camera. That's why cameras call a camera. To capture the image, you've got to have something that's photosensitive, which became film uh, that you would use. So the modern camera is a miniature camera obscura with a lens in place of just a pinhole. Okay. Let's take a look at reflection. Now we have two kinds of reflection what's called um, diffuse reflection and specular reflection. I'll start with specular. Specular comes from the Latin speculum, which means mirror. This is a reflection from a smooth, polished surface, like a mirror. So for specular reflection, we have what's called the law of reflection. Which is the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So if we have, uh, let's say, a mirror. Here's the edge of a mirror, go sideways. Let's draw a line normal to the surface of the mirror. Normal means perpendicular. Now, an incident light ray, meaning the one coming in to this point, will be reflected at the same angle. So theta sub i, i for incident, is equal to theta sub r, r for reflected. So theta i equals theta r. There, that's the law of reflection. Now, one other point, though, is that we, this is a three-dimensional world that we live in. If we look down onto the mirror, there's our mirror. There are the edges of it. The light rays... Uh, the light ray that comes in and the one that goes out don't just have that angle in common, they're also going to be in the same plane. Like that. They are coplanar in that sense. Alright, so whatever plane this one is in and perpendicular to the surface that one will also be in the plane that's uh, formed by that ray and the normal line as well. Furthermore, if you have several rays parallel to each other, all coming into the surface, they will reflect as a similar bundle of parallel rays. All the same thing, because your surface is smooth in this case. And at a small, on a small scale, flat. Now, the other kind is diffuse reflection. This is for rough surfaces. Now, if I magnify a rough surface here, there's a cross, a cross section of a rough surface, a light ray coming in here and one coming in here will hit at different points on the bumps. So that one might go off this way, whereas that one goes off this way, and one that comes in here comes back like that, and one that comes in that just sort of grazes along that way. Paper, for example, diffuse reflection, for the most part, because you've got those fibers in the paper. Uh, and the bumps, kind of a general rule is, the surface will be considered rough and give you a diffuse reflection if the size of the bumps is greater than or roughly equal to the wavelength of the light that you're shining on it. And so you get scattering from that, diffuse light. 
But that has its uses as well. You might you often want to fuse light in some cases. All right, let's take a look at forming an image in a plane, meaning flat mirror. I'm going to turn my camera around. So if I've got my mirror here, and let's say that I've got an object, I'm going to draw a point source, I'll call it P, or point. For convenience sake, I'll use OBJ for object, at point capital P. Let's say that you're looking here, there's your eye. So the light ray going from the object has to bounce off at the same angle that it came in. All right? There. But what your eye sees, see the eye assumes that light travels in straight lines. That's what it feels like to it. And so your eye, as far as your eye is concerned, the object that gave the light is actually over here. That's called the image. Usually I'll use IMG for image. Now, in this case, it's called a virtual image as opposed to a real image. Virtual image means one that the light rays do not actually come from where that image is. So it's just a reflection. It's not really there. No light rays focus on that point. All the light is over here. This is on the dark back side of the mirror. Now, another thing is that the image will appear to be at the same distance from the mirror that the object is. So this distance, which for whatever reason is labeled S, is the same distance as what's going to be S prime. Object distance S is the same as the image distance S prime. And that's true for any image formed in a plane mirror. Now, notice one more thing. The virtual image being at this, well, a mirror image location from the object occurs because the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And because you draw a line through here, that's equal, that's also the same as the image, the angle of reflection there, here and here by geometry. So that's what makes that virtual image look to be in the same spot there that the real object is on the opposite side. Okay. Um, you can tell a bit more about the distance. A single light ray doesn't prove that that's the same distance. What if it looked like it was farther out here? What if we take an extended object? So let's take a person. And in fact, the book has a, a tree, but it has it leaning. I'll take a person leaning. Okay. Now, if I take a light ray going from the head, all right, so here's the eye. I'm going to trace it back into the virtual side of the mirror. Now let's take one from a foot. Let's take this foot here. Now to get to here, it's got to reflect off a point that's halfway between. Oh, man. That looks about right. So what you wind up with, eh, I didn't do that very well. That's better. I think I'm kind of cheating on this, but it does really work. Uh, so anyway, the image is not only 
It, it's flipped around. It's a, uh, each up. I should say each point here. The head is the same distance from the mirror as the uh, image of the head is. This foot is the same distance as the image of that foot is. So parts of the object that are farther away from the mirror will have a virtual image for that part will also be farther away. OK, now from this, we can do a nice little problem. Boat does this example. Uh, oh, and it also notes there are plenty of other light rays that hit the mirror. All I've drawn are the ones that happen to reach your eye. If you look from this one here, what about the light ray that goes here? Well, it comes off there. This one goes off here. So we're only going to be interested in the light rays that hit your eye or your the camera, whatever you're using to detect. So let's take a look and find out how big a mirror would have to be for you to see your entire body in it and where would it have to be placed. This is an interesting and somewhat surprising example. Okay, so we've got a person. somewhat exaggerated in figure, uh, who's standing in front of a mirror here. There's the floor. Now, how much of this mirror, this floor ceiling mirror, mirror is actually used to see yourself? Let's say that your eye is here. I'm not drawing you looking sideways because otherwise your eyes here is actually a little closer to it. I wouldn't have all the distances be the same. Now, for the top, to see the top of your head, that's going to be a line. Now, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So between here and here, it's going to be a point that it hits the mirror at a point halfway in height between. Now, see your feet. Light ray from your foot, oh boy, that's wrong, comes up and goes to there. So, you only need a mirror that's that big. You see, you're never, you're, to see your own foot or top of your head, you're never going to use anything that goes above this or below that. Well, what if you walk closer to the wall? Is it, don't you need a bigger mirror or maybe a smaller one? Or what if you walk away from it? Take a look. Let's say that your height is H. Make sure that this all fits on. Yeah. H. Now, clearly we've got two light rays we're interested in. So let's say that the length of the first, from, I'm sorry, the length from your eye to the top of your head is L1. I'm using a script lowercase l. And from your eye down to the bottom of your foot, that's L2. So, if your eye is uh, L2 above the floor, Like that. You see, the mirror's going to go a little bit above your eye. Um, the mirror size is, well, let's see. Eye to the top of the head is L1. So from the eye to the top of the mirror is L1 over 2. And from the eye to the bottom of the mirror, well, that's clearly L2 over 2. And so the height of the whole mirror is simply L1 over 2 plus L2 over 2, which is 1 half L1 plus L2. And L1 plus L2 is H. So the height of the whole mirror is half your height, exactly. And notice that the result that I got doesn't say anything about how far away from the mirror you are. So the result has to hold in general. If you walk closer to the mirror, you see more of the world around you, but you also take up more of it. So you're not seeing extra parts of your body. 
If you step away from the mirror, you've seen only a narrower field of view in the reflection, but your own reflection is smaller too, and it's exactly filtered. As long as you hang it at that height. Okay. Uh, let me see, I'll do a refraction, and then I'm going to have to stop it to do uh, to have a meeting, and then I'll come back and do one more recording. So we've had reflection, which is light rays bouncing off of things. Let's deal with light rays going through things. Refraction is the bending of light as it comes from one material into another. So a good example is it going from air into glass or air into water. Let's say that this is air and this is glass. A light ray an incoming ray coming in like that will have some amount of reflection. There's the reflected ray. And some amount of refraction. Okay. The first thing to do with it is that there, just like we had a law of reflection, there is a law of refraction which is called Snell's Law. That means, or uh, sorry, Snell's Law is if I have uh, a material up here and it's going to have an index of refraction, and we covered that before, in one, and then a material down here with an index N2. And the light ray, let's say I'm going to draw the normal line, perpendicular. The incoming light ray comes in at this angle. Now we measure the angle from the normal line, not from the horizontal, not from the surface. I'm not going to say incoming and refracted in this case, because we might reverse things, and it's this will make it easier. So the, uh, the first angle in material one is that. And the second angle, as it goes through to material two, is that. Snell's law says that the index of refraction of the first material times the sine of its angle is equal to the index of refraction of the second material times the sine of its angle. That is Snell's law, very important. So, if the index of refraction of the second material is higher than for the first, let's say it's from air, which has an index of refraction of about 1, into glass, which has an index of refraction of about 1.5, this means the angle must get smaller in the second material in that whichever one has the higher index of refraction. So, it will bend toward the normal, closer to the vertical line. This is also reversible. If this is the incoming ray in the glass coming out here, and it goes into a material with a smaller index of refraction, it bends away from the normal. This is going to be how our optical components like lenses and prisms work. Now, uh, so the light rays are reversible. That's another important point. So what's the index of refraction? Okay. The index of refraction, which we use lowercase n, is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum, c, to the speed of light in the material, uh, medium, which we usually just use V, but I'm labeling it subscript medium. Now, speed of light in a vacuum is a number that you should have memorized. 
dollars. It is three times ten to the eighth, three times ten to the eighth meters per second. And the speed of light in the medium is going to be slower than that, always. So, since the speed of light in the medium is always less than or equal to C. I said, I said equal to now. Let's consider that a vacuum itself might be a medium. So, with that sense, that's the only case where it would be equal to the speed of light in the vacuum. Since V is always less than or equal to C, then N will always be greater than or equal to 1. And the only case when it is equal to 1 is only for a vacuum. In practice, the index of refraction for air is so close to one that we round it off there. But air does have an index of refraction that's greater than one. Uh, here's a useful table for a few of these. So let's see. For a vacuum, n is equal to one exactly. For air, 1.003. Sorry, 1.0003 for water, 1.33 for glass, about 1.5. It actually varies for different kinds of glass because we use this for optical equipment. Uh, there's a whole range of glasses that are used with different indices of refraction, but 1.5 is pretty close. Uh, and diamond. Two point four one. It bends a lot, and this because the index of refraction. Eventually, I'll tell you that it changes a little bit with wavelength. That's going to separate the colors, like the prism. That's why diamonds sparkle so much because they have a large index of refraction and they separate the colors out very well. Okay, so why does light refract at all? If it slows down. Why does it bend? <clears throat> Let's say that I've got two light rays coming in, or several light rays coming in. Let's say that my first material is something like air or a vacuum with a small index of refraction. And my second one has a larger index of refraction. So I'm saying N2 is greater than N1. N2, which is greater than N1. That's an awkward notation here. There we go. Okay, so the light rays come in like this. A large angle, a large incident angle. Now, if I were to draw the wave fronts, these are the rays, but let's look at the, at the wave fronts. They'll be perpendicular to the rays. Let's say that I'm drawing only the wave crests. They're spaced out like this. Now, what happens when the wave front hits this material? Well, this heavier, well, not necessarily heavier. This higher index of refraction material slows down the wave. <clears throat> so these edges out here slow down so they're traveling, well, they're traveling slower, which means that they have to change angle. Now, every if I look at every individual wave spot on the wave here, you could, you could even say that it were to move in a straight line, but it would be the spacing between them get smaller. And by doing that, then, you wind up with them, the wave fronts at a different angle, which will also mean, then, the refractive rays come in at a different angle. 
because as soon as one edge of this slows down, this part is still going on faster. And so they, it winds up leaving behind the bed to away from all the different direction. Now, let me just look at two rays. There's the surface. If I've got this ray coming in here and one next to it coming in there, and let's say that they go through this change in angle. Okay. Now, if I've got them spaced out one wavelength apart here, and so the refractive ray is like and here, so the refractive ray is like this. Okay. That's a right angle, and that is supposed to be a right angle. So, the wavelength, the hatch marks are all the material, on the side of the material that has the higher index of refraction. That's wavelength that it has in this material in one. And down here, the spacings between the wave fronts is the wavelength it has in material two. Now, let's say that the distance between that point and this point is a lowercase l for length. Not wavelength, just length. All right, so what are the angles involved? Now, I've got Draw a normal line here. If that angle is the same as the, now let's see, I'm going to do it over here. Okay. This is the incident angle, or the angle in material one, theta sub one. Now, that's a normal line, that's the horizontal, that's the incident ray. That means that's also, from a little bit of uh, geometry, equal to this angle. So that's theta 1 there. Let's take a look in the uh, lower material. For the refracted ray, that's theta 2. That's the refracted angle. Now, since that's the refracted angle, then this is also theta 2 here. Okay, now, taking a look, we've got two triangles here and here. And we're going to see that they share a hypotenuse in common. So I need a little bit of room over here. Okay, I've got that much room. So, let's take the upper triangle, this one here. All right, so that's L, that's lambda 1, and that's theta 1. All right, the sine of theta 1 is equal to, the sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So let's see, opposite over hypotenuse, lambda 1 over L. So solving for L, because it's in both triangles, and we're going to use it again, L is equal to lambda 1 over sine theta 1. Now here, let's take the lower triangle. Okay. Now I've got theta 2 is this angle. That's L. And let's see, this is lambda 2, this short side here. Now, sine of theta 2 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So lambda 2 over L. So L equals lambda 2 over sine of theta 2. Okay, so let's equate this L with that L. It's the same L.
So if L equals L, and it usually does, right? Then lambda 1 over sine theta 1 equals lambda 2 over sine theta 2. All right, I'm going to cross multiply. Uh, but one more thing I'm going to do. I've got wavelengths here. Now, I've been dealing with wave speed. Index of a fraction is C over V, V being the wave speed, light speed, in that material. So, since, uh, let's see, velocity is, velocity is wavelength times frequency. Remember what I said before, it's worth saying again. The frequency of light does not change when it moves from one material into another. True is, the uh, same is true also for um, other waves. But here we're dealing with light, so frequency stays the same. That means that wavelength, lambda, is equal to V over frequency. F being the same in both material 1 and material 2. So I've got velocity in material 1 over frequency times sine theta 1 equals velocity in material 2 over the same frequency times sine theta 2. Frequency is canceled. Uh, let's see here. Oh, no, I want to do one more thing. N is equal to C over V. So V equals C over N. Oh, boy. I said that in, I should have done that all in one fell swoop. So anyway, to save you the suspenseful draw, n2 sine theta 2 winds up being equal to n1 sine theta 1. Very awkwardly drawn there. And just for that extra little bit of uh, algebra, uh, I will make one more point on this. Let's turn this around and make the space. Oh, that is. Um, before I get to my last point, there's one more point before that. So let's say that I've got some material like that with two sides that are parallel. Let's say we've got air, glass, and back to air. A light ray that comes in this way, glass has a higher index of refraction than air. It will turn, the ray will turn towards the normal here. But as it comes out from glass and back into air, it'll turn away from the normal. In this case, because these two sides are parallel, your incoming light ray and your outgoing light ray from the whole slab are parallel to each other, but shifted. You can see that if you take a, a, a piece of plain glass, plate glass, and turn it around like that and look at things behind, uh, through the glass, you'll see them seem to shift left and right. Now, if I take a triangle shape, all right, if I've got a light ray that comes in horizontally here, it bends towards the normal, so it bends down at some angle here. But now it bends at this one, it bends away from the normal, but this is at a different angle. This, uh, the normal's at a different angle. So that winds up bending it even farther down there. Now that looks like a prism, and it is a prism, but we haven't yet gotten to why the different colors of light come out differently in this. So that'll be in the next, uh, uh, the next lecture, the next take. Okay, what I want to get to now is what's called total internal reflection. Total internal reflection. Take a look again at Snell's law. Okay. 
Now, if I've got, let's say I've got a light ray coming from glass into air. Let's take one ray that goes up very steeply and then it's refracted away from normal. That's theta 1, that bigger angle is theta 2. And this is where n2, n1, and I've got um, n2 is less than n1. Okay, again, like glass and air. Now, as I increase theta 1, okay, let's make it at a slightly larger angle there. Now, you see that this is going to be a larger angle as well. What if I get to the point when this one, the outgoing ray, is horizontal, right along the edge of the glass there. Hmm. Then I'm not going to see it. In the, it's not going to be transmitted. It'll just skim along the edge. Furthermore, what happens if I make an even larger angle? You would wind up with reflected ray on the inside. Now, there are reflective rays in both of these cases, too. Down there, down there. Of course, whatever. This angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. Most of the time, we just ignore that because I want to see the transmitted ray. But in this case, there is no transmitted ray whatsoever. So the complete ray is reflected. Total internal reflection. I've just written total. So, what is the angle where that occurs? Alright, given Snell's law, let's solve for, uh, well, let's just get to this exact angle here. I'll call that the crit, well, everybody calls that the critical angle, theta sub c where the outgoing angle, theta 2, is equal to 90 degrees. For any angle larger than that, theta 1 greater than theta critical, you get the total internal reflection. And for theta 1 smaller than that critical angle, you get uh, a transmitted ray, as well as some weak reflection. All right, so find the critical angle. It depends on the materials that you're going from and into. So, that's defined by theta 2 being 90 degrees. So I've got N1, uh, let's see here. Let me put N2 on the left. N2 sine theta 2 equals N1 sine theta 1. And I'm going to make theta 1, uh, why did I do that? Now let's put 1 on the left. Two on the right. So theta 2 equals 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees is 1. So n1 sine theta 1 equals n2. Solve for sine theta 1. n2 over n1. Really what I want is theta 1, not sine theta 1. So that means I take the arc sign, or on your calculator marked as the inverse sign. Looks like sine to the minus one, but it's not a power, it's just a symbol. Theta one is equal to the arc sign of n2 over n1. And all I did was set the transmitted rays angle to 90 degrees in Snell's law. Now for water into air, Water has, uh, let's see, N1 is 1.33, and for air, N2 is about equal to 1, and 1.00, 1 1.0003. This is close enough. So, theta, oh, this is, boy, theta critical error, sorry. For the critical angle. So theta critical is going to be equal to the arc sine 
of 1 over 1.33, which means take the arc sine of 1 over 1.33, you get 48.75 degrees. So you can take a beam of light, shine it at an angle greater than 48.75 degrees, and you'll get it reflected down here. An application of this is in optical fibers. Optical fiber is just a kind of plastic, little plastic uh, uh, fiber. It's not a hollow tube, but a solid fiber. And you shine a light beam in it. Well, you can bend this fiber. If you just shine the light beam in a straight line, you've got a light beam in a straight line. But if you bend the fiber, it seems to conduct the light beam. The light beam will bounce off of the edges of the fiber. And as long as you don't kink the fiber, if you don't turn it too hard, all of your reflection angles, uh, incident angles, will be less than uh, 48.75 degrees. Make sure I said angles smaller than 48.75 degrees. Uh, no, greater than that, greater than that. If you don't kink it too much, then, because we're measuring from the normal, it's always grazing along the edges of this, and so it never gets an angle uh, it always gets totally internally reflected, so you have very little loss of the signal over an optical fiber. Your biggest source of loss is actually from the absorption of the material itself. It's not totally transparent. Uh, one other use of it, not for any practical purpose, is in uh, being under a swimming pool. And if you look at things at certain angles, you can't see the sky above past a certain angle because you get the total internal reflection. All right, and we'll pick it up here with forming an image by refraction, and then we'll get to dispersion. Okay.